Good morning. Good morning. May the joy and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us to celebrate your love, your joy, your peace. We pray that you will bless this hour together, that we may leave this place a better person. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms, the 146th chapter. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princesses, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth, and that very day their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is in the Lord God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made their heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the stranger. He upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked will be brought to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. If you'll turn with me to 240 in your hymn books, we'll stand and sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs>
our fellowship song, Emmanuel.
Oh, no, yeah. We're too early. We could probably be there about 5.30. Are you guys around? the Apostles' Creed, found on page 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's our pleasure to have Jim and Carol Burkhart come and light our candle of joy. Joy. We have peace too, <laughs> but even more joy. Good morning. I'm Jim and this is Carol. Uh, we've been privileged to be a member of this church for just over a year now. And uh, we're going to light the candle of joy. And Carol's going to read. This morning I'm going to read um, Peter Marshall's sermon, Let's Keep Christmas, to represent this candle. This is a special story to me. It's something I grew up with. My father read this book ever since I, I don't remember a Christmas without my father reading this book to our family during the Christmas season. 
And then that tradition stopped in 1980, no, actually December of 79. Um, we had visited my parents' home that Christmas and were out shopping. I was uh, about eight months pregnant, seven and a half months pregnant. And we got a call out at the mall while we were shopping with my parents that their house was burning down. And so the book was destroyed. And the book was no longer in print at that time. And my father spent the next almost 11 years, and once the internet, <laughs> once Al Gore discovered the internet, <laughs> my father was able to do a search, and he came up with a warehouse that had four copies of Let's Keep Christmas on the Shelf, and so he bought a copy for each of us four children, and so I, I do have a copy today. He became, Peter Marshall became um, a little bit more important to me a few years later when I went to college, uh, what well, was actually before that, I'd already become kind of acquainted with Peter Marshall. I went to a small conservative Christian college, and um, in order to graduate, you had to take this theology class, which everybody really looked forward to taking. <laughs> And I found myself enrolled in this class um, with Dr. What was his? And, and um, there were nothing but male students except for myself in the class. And most of these males, almost 100% of them, were studying to go to seminary. I was very much out of place. And um, one of the projects in that class, you had to write about, there was a Christian, you had to choose like a theologian. I don't even know if Peter Marshall was a theologian, but it was the only name I knew. And so I, I studied his life and did a whole biography on him and really fell in love with the man. So I'm, I'm glad to be able to share this with you this morning. Changes are everywhere. Many institutions and customs that we once thought sacrosanct have gone by the board. Yet there are a few that abide defying time and revolution. The old message for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, is still the heart of Christmas. It can be nothing else. And this message can neither be changed nor quite forgotten, although there are many things that tend to make us forget. The idea of Santa Claus coming in a helicopter does not ring true. No interior decorator with a fondness for yellow or blue or chartreuse or pink could ever persuade me to forsake the colors of red and green. I must confess that modernistic Christmas cards leave me cold. I cannot appreciate the dogs and cats, the galloping horses, the ships in full sail, the ribald humor, or any of the cute designs that leave out the traditional symbols of the star, the manger, the wise men on their camels. Angels there must be, but they need not be the modernistic angels in evening dress with peroxide permanence or avant-garde hairdos. There is no need to search for stories new and different. There is only one, after all. And no modern author can improve it. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. We all feel the pressure of approaching Christmas. The traffic's terrible. Peter Marshall died in 1948. You can't find a parking space. <laughs> the stores are crowded. Mob scenes make shopping a nightmare. You are thinking about presents, wondering what in the world you can get for so-and-so. You think of friends and loved ones who are so hard to shop for. You can't think of anything they need which is rather strange when you take the time to think of it. Maybe there is nothing in a store that they need. But what about some token of love? What about love itself and friendship and understanding and consideration and a helping hand and a smile and a prayer? You can't buy those things in a store, and these are the things that people need. We all need them. Blessed will be they who receive them this Christmas or at any time. Let's not permit the rush 
to crowd Christmas out of our hearts, for that is where it belongs. Christmas is not in the stores, but in the hearts of people. Let's not give way to cynicism and mutter that Christmas has become commercialized. It never will be, unless you let it be. Your Christmas is not commercialized unless you have commercialized it. Let's not succumb to the sophistication that complains Christmas belongs only to the children. That shows you have never understood Christmas at all. For the older you get, the more it means, if you know what it means. Christmas, though forever young, grows old along with us. Have you been saying, I just can't seem to feel the Christmas spirit this year? That's too bad. As a confession of lack of faith, it is rather significant. You are really saying that you feel no joy that Jesus came into the world. You are confessing that his presence in the world is not a reality to you. Maybe you need all the more to read the Christmas story over again. Need to sit down with the Gospel of Luke and think about it. I thank God for Christmas. Would that it lasted all year. For I have observed that on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day, all the world is a better place. And men and women are more lovable. Love itself seeps into every heart, and miracles happen. When Christmas doesn't make your heart swell up until it nearly bursts and fill your eyes with tears and make you all soft and warm inside, then you'll know something inside of you is dead. We hope there will be snow for Christmas. Why? It's not really important, but it's nice and old-fashioned and appropriate, we think. Isn't it wonderful to think that nothing can really harm the joy of Christmas? Although your Christmas tree decorations may include many new gadgets, such as lights with bubbles in them, <laughs> it's the old tree decorations that mean the most, the ones you save carefully from year to year, the crooked star that goes on top of the tree, the ornaments that you've been so careful with. And you'll bring out the tiny manger in the shed and the little figures of the Holy Family and arrange them lovingly on the mantel or in the middle of the dining room table. And getting the tree will be a family event with great excitement for the children. And there will be a closet into which you'll forbid your husband to look. And he'll be moving through the house mysteriously with bundles under his coat, and you'll pretend to not notice. There will be fragrance of cookies baking, spices, and fruitcake, and the warmth of the house shall be melodious with the lilting strains of silent night, holy night. And you'll listen to the wonderful Christmas music on the radio or television. Some of the songs will be modern, good enough music perhaps, but it's the old carols, the lovely old Christmas hymns that will mean the most. And forests of fir trees will march right into our living room. There will be bells on our doors and holly wreaths on our windows and we shall sweep the Noel skies for their brightest colors and festoon our homes with stars. There will be a chubby stocking hung by the fireplace. And with finger to lip, you will whisper and ask me to tiptoe for a little tousled head is asleep and must not be awakened until after Santa has come. And finally, Christmas morning will come. Don't worry. You will be ready for it. You will catch the spirit all right. Or it will catch you, which is even better. And then you will remember what Christmas really means the beginning of Christianity, the second chance for the world, the hope for peace, and the only way. The promise that the angels sang is the most wonderful music the world has ever heard, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. It's not a pronouncement on the state of the world then, nor is it a reading of the international barometer today, but it is a promise. God's promise of what one day will come to pass. The years that are gone are graveyards in which all the persuasions of men have crumbled into dust. If history has any voice, it is to say that all these ways of men lead nowhere. There remains only one way, the way 
untried, untested, unexplored fully. The way of him who was born a babe in Bethlehem. In a world that seems to not only be changing, but even to be dissolving, there are millions of us who want Christmas to be the same. With the same old greeting, Merry Christmas, and no other. We long for the abiding love among men of goodwill that the season brings, because we believe in this ancient miracle of Christmas with its softening, sweetening influence to tug at our heartstrings once again. Thank you, Carol and Jim. Our beautiful flowers today on the altar are given by Ruthie and uh, Ariel uh, Perry in memory of uh, Brian. Please take a look at the bulletin. All the announcements are there with the exception of Wednesday. There is no noon Wednesday Bible study. As many of you know, uh, Norman Quinn went home to be with his Lord uh, last week, about Friday, and the memorial service is at 1 p.m. at Northside uh, Funeral Home with a graveside following, and then at 3 p.m. there will be a reception here at the uh, church. So keep, please keep that in mind. Are there any other announcements? Don't forget the brochure that was in your bulletin. I understand Santa will be here next week, uh, enjoying a wonderful time together with all the boys and the girls, and uh, we hope to see all the little kids here with us next week. Okay. And I would say that if, if some people feel inadequate in knocking on doors and sharing the gospel, I understand. That's not an easy thing to do. It's easy to invite people to participate in stuff that's fun and having the real Santa here Saturday. We'll have hot breakfast. They'll be making crafts. There'll be cookies. Uh, where else y'all want? <laughs> so uh, I would encourage you. I mean, you know, when, when we have volunteers that go to this effort to do this, uh, it makes sense that we bring as many people in here as we can. So I would ask you to take this and invite whether you have kids, grandkids, neighbors, coworkers. It's a wonderful opportunity to get people to do it because this is what I've learned. That folks that have come here, I hear this all the time when they walk through the door and say, Jesus, I just feel so welcomed. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I've never heard anybody say they felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in here that hadn't been here yet. <laughs> so to do that, we got to invite them. So here's your opportunity. and It's going to be a great day. We've been just so blessed throughout this uh, holiday season and the wonderful event, the uh, gathering they had for the women yesterday and had the fine china out and the silver and uh, apparently they had a lovely time of exchanging ornaments. I think I think my wife threw a bit of a tantrum when she didn't know what she wanted. <laughs> she's an only child for <laughs> and she's used to being incredibly spoiled so that's okay. <laughs> Yeah. So we're uh, and, and then uh, also just as a reminder that on Christmas Eve, our service is at three, five, and seven. The five and seven will be traditional candlelight. Three will be a service that's geared toward children and families. It'll be a little different. Then Christmas Day, which is on Sunday, we will be here on Christmas Day because we want everybody to have a chance to sleep in or just enjoy your Christmas morning. We won't have service at eight thirty or eleven. We'll do one service at noon. It's going to be a come as you are. What I mean is whether you got 
a pajamas, robe, <laughs> slippers, whatever. It's going to be a very casual, fun service. And then bring a gift or toy that you got, whatever it may be, and then we'll do a little show and tell. That'll be one service Christmas Day at noon. So I invite you to be a part of that. And, and just throughout the season, what an opportunity it is to share some of the blessings that, that we have experienced. And, and also just that, uh, well, uh, regardless of that time of year, we... Uh, we want to walk with one another, stand with one another, pray with one another. And so I remind everybody we start each week, Monday morning here at 9 a.m. with prayer. We look over all the names in our bulletin, all the new concerns that come up. So if you have any specific concerns, any additional ones, please write them on a piece of paper and put that in the offering plate. We'll remain faithful to that, certainly for the Quinn family. Uh, June Butler's daughter, uh, Catherine, had a, uh, a terrible accident last week. She actually slipped uh, on a hardwood floor in her, on her, uh, in her stocking feet and, and I think hit the corner of a granite countertop and, and uh, has a seriously bad uh, you know, eye injury and, and her vision's at risk and they're going to have to uh, repair that, that the whole orbital bone around her eye. And, yeah, it's, uh, very difficult. So please pray for uh, June's daughter Catherine, her family. And so uh, what are the prayer concerns or Thanksgiving we want to raise up this morning. Benjamin? Yes. I have a good watch in which document you can get daddy with red button shirt at school, whatever spring and then bow and crest. Okay. Got a full agenda. Amen. Amen. A full agenda. Yes. That's a good thing. Yeah, somewhere Falcon Crest was in there. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Benjamin. Monday, we're having our famous Christmas party at the house. Famous Christmas party, Heather no, House, all Monday. All welcome, and please come and make these people have a real nice, beautiful Christmas. Right across the street, Heather, what time is it, Mary? Starting, I think it starts about 1.30, maybe before any time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all going to have cookies there? Oh, right. <laughs> Give me cookies. Yes, Rob. Uh, Gary Williams is having surgery on Friday. Uh, absolutely. Praying for Gary's upcoming surgery. And that's this week? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yes, over in the corner. Julia. Um, ask for prayers for the students taking final exams this week. Mm. Students taking final exams and... And also for the college students, everybody will be coming home for the holidays. Just uh, pray for them. So. Yes? Uh, we have a new great grandson in the Curry family. Uh, Nathan's uh, uh, brother, uh, Niles, in North Carolina, is uh, grandfather. He and Janet are grandparents now. Uh, she was born Friday evening, and her name is Juliet Marie. Juliet Marie. Another addition to the Curry family. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, it's a wonderful ministry of the church. We're going to go down and serve the homeless on Saturday. But here's the deal. Y'all can come and have breakfast with Santa at 9.30 and still have time to go serve the homeless. What could be better than that? So, this Saturday. And we're going to meet at Hickory Flat. We're going to meet at Hickory Flat, UMC. Yeah, sometime around noon, 1. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to and start cooking at 10. Okay. So you leave about noon. Okay. That's Steve Sheldon leads that news. Well, it's great to see you all here. Uh, it's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord and just all that's taking place. And let's be in an attitude of prayer. Mm -hmm.
Lord, it is so good to be in your presence and the warmth of the sanctuary. It's our desire that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord. Lord, help us to understand the need, whatever that need is. Lord, that we might have eyes to see, that we might have ears to hear, just that we would be sensitive just to all those, Lord, who were, you know, have a physical ailment, those who are struggling in their relationships or with emotional challenges, Lord, we just pray for continued miracles as we celebrate the ones that we've experienced. Lord, our hearts are heavy with all the need that, uh, that we just feel overwhelmed with at times. So all the names listed in our bulletin. For those families, Lord, for the, especially for the Quins. We just want to lift them up and the joy that Norman has been for us and what he's meant to so many. For Gary Williams and his upcoming surgery, Lord, we pray that that would go flawlessly, that there would be uh, no complications whatsoever. Lord, we, we pray for June's daughter, Catherine, and, and that she might also find recovery and, and healing from her injury. But Lord, more importantly for all these things, that while we, we desire physical healing and emotions and relationships, just that spiritually our hearts would soar with understanding of this time of season and the joy that it represents for us, that we have a hope, a hope, Lord, that uh, covers all men and women, regardless of origins or, Lord, just across every denomination that they would know that there's a God in heaven who put skin on and came to earth that we might know who we were created to be, Lord, and just the just the blessings that you desire that we would share with others. And so, Lord, help us give us hearts for the needy. Help us give us a passion, Lord, that we would reach out to those who are less fortunate and that they might know the peace that we have. Lord, help us celebrate in this day, a day like none other that has ever existed, that we would take full opportunity of the joy and the opportunities we have and that we would remain a like body of believers United as we gather together and praise your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give to you. We thank you for the opportunities of joy and peace and love and caring throughout this Christmas season, but we pray that we may continue it in giving to others. In your name we pray, amen.
Oh, we failed to mention, if you all noticed, the gorgeous artwork on the cover of your bulletin. Thanks to Aaron Bowser. A Aaron, stand up. Yay. So at this time of year, as, you know, as Carol was reading about what, what Christmas, really the significance of what it means and what we desire and, and you know, how much we want others to feel blessed and have that, that, you know, sort of warm family sort of experience and everything would be just right and so we go out and buy things accordingly and I know in past years when we participated in like, you know, the angel tree where we'd take the names of families or individuals and buy gifts and, and the thing is, you know, our tendency is really almost to overdo it and the reason is because we know the needy, we want them to feel blessed, don't we? We, we want them to feel like they're loved and and so we compensate for that by maybe buying more than they need and more than we should. But I'll be honest, when I'm out there buying those gifts and we're thinking about, and it's heartbreaking seeing the need out there, people that don't have anything at Christmas. But I didn't want to fix them for a day. I know buying these gifts, I wanted to fix their lives. I don't buy them stuff, and, and so they had this awesome experience, and, and it, would, it would change everything. But that worked that way. So one year, I remember we, I mean, it was like two or three boys and raised by a single dad and we purchased gifts and we went out to deliver the gifts to uh, Trailer Park where they lived. And, and so as you're, as you're buying gifts and you're wrapping them up, your, your vision is what you want to do for them, how you want them to feel and have the same sort of experience that we get to have. I remember bringing the things there and the kids came running out and the dad and it was about a week before Christmas. The gifts did not make it to the, the door of their home they just tore them all up. They couldn't wait. And I remember thinking, you know, I wanted them. I was thinking, I wanted them to wait till Santa brought his gifts so that on Christmas morning they could have this, this experience. But they didn't really care about that. They were needy. They were looking for this warm, glowing sort of Christmas morning. Like, their need was far greater than that, and it wasn't going to be fixed by having a soccer ball or a football or... And we're going to be inadequate to really do what we wanted to do. Sure, there's physical needs and things we want to address, but truthfully, what we're talking about and what Carol read, there's, uh, there's greater need. There's bigger issue. And that's what, our, that's what our gospel lesson is today in the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to take it out. If not, you may reach for a pew Bible ahead of you, the 11th chapter of Matthew. I'm going to read verses 2 through 11. It's sort of a follow-up from last week when I was discussing the ministry of John the Baptist. Matthew 11, verse 2, When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet, yes, and I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare you the way before the Lord. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there is not risen among anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the word of God for the people of God. So we, we have this, this circumstance where, where John had been sent as a precursor to Christ to call people to repentance and, and announce that the, that the Christ is, is coming, make straight path for the Lord. And, and so John was also part of his ministry that said through his baptism that the Christ would be identified. And sure enough, when Jesus came to be baptized by John, if you remember, is that time of baptism, the, the Spirit in the form of a dove descended so John would have known this is the Christ. 
But here we have it. You would almost see a crisis of faith. Sometime later, John is now in prison, and he, and he hears about what Christ is doing, and John sends his disciples to go talk to Jesus, and the question is, are you the one, or is there one coming after you? And you can almost understand from John's perspective. Now, now by the way, Jesus in no way criticizes his lack of faith. Matter of fact, uh, you know, conversely, what he says is, among those born of women, none there have been born greater than John the Baptist. His crisis of faith here is understandable, and we all have it at one time or another. We wonder, we're curious, and we don't understand things. And, and I think part of that reason is, you know, the Lord in, in explaining and revealing to us, revealing to the prophets and making his will known, you know, he doesn't fill in a lot of the blanks. You know, the, the, the Lord sort of, he, he covers a lot of the big picture things, uh, but it's almost on a need-to-know basis. And what I mean is, you know, what the Lord said to, you know, said to Noah is, I've had enough of the evil that has overcome the world, so I will destroy this. As you build an ark and, and be safe to the ark. So he, he gave Noah this plan, and Noah spent all this time building an ark. But he didn't go into great detail about the travails and troubles and how, how long Noah and his family would be in that ark and, and how long it would take them to be restored. He doesn't fill in all those blanks. He provides the big picture. And same with Abraham. The Lord gave his covenant to Abraham. He says that, that, that you will have descendants as multiple as the stars in the sky. And, and through you, this, this Hebrew nation, he said, be a blessing. Not only that, not only blessing the Jews, but through the Jews, all nations will be blessed. And so Abraham recognized that he and his wife, they weren't young. They heard the big picture book because... God didn't fill in all these blanks is that we know that Abraham and Sarai was his wife were like what's happening here and so then you know Sarai has this idea to bring in the slave woman to have Abraham's heir his child because well they sort of lack faith in what the Lord told them to do cuz God didn't fill in all the blanks that's where it's John the Baptist wondering we got a king who's coming that the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the good news is pronounced is that justice will be ushered in. And when we think about when the king shows up, when the authority shows up, is that all injustice will be fixed and all those right, who've done us wrong, that's going to be taken care of. And righteousness will reign. That's what we knew about the Messiah. But John now sitting in prison and looking at what Jesus has done, got to be wondering, is this it? Now, mind you, he doesn't deny, he doesn't say, you know, well, this can't be the one. They ask the question, are you the Christ? Or is there one coming after? Well, the Jesus' answer wasn't, yes, it's me. What's he tell them? He says, just two things. One is, listen, hear, and watch. Right? It's in word and deed. It says, tell John what you see. What do you see? The deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cured. That's what you see. What do you hear? And good news is preached to the poor. Good news preached to the poor. See, we know that there's needs out there, and we're called to meet those needs. But you imagine, good news preached to the poor, there's a greater, a greater issue than just food and clothing, which we need, but by nature is temporary. Even Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils, but for... The eternal. Greater picture. And it was a, a magazine store when the discipleship guides about a, uh, a pastor in the nation of Chad when Chad was going through a civil war in Africa and it was terrible and, and it was great starvation and, and people were desperate. The pastor had been on a journey and on his way back to his home nation. He stopped at the Ivory Coast and he was visiting with some missionaries and they knew the desperation was people. They said, we will fill your suitcase with food and medicine. Pastor said, I don't want food and medicine. Fill my suitcase with Bibles. Because my people have learned not to focus on what is temporary, but to focus on what can never be taken away. The food that will never disappear. And so Jesus meets greater needs, all the above. It's not one or the other, it's all the above. And the good news is preached to the poor. Which also raises a question, 
Who's the poor? Uh, 11 Revelation, and let's turn to, if you have your Bible there, turn to third chapter of Revelation, and Jesus talks about who the poor are. The poor, the people don't know they're poor. Revelation, chapter 3, verse 14, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write this, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, who we know is, that would be, that'd be Jesus, and this is his words, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, and by the way, what are all the things that Messiah is going to address? All these things. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. He's talking about people who can't see that aren't blind. People that are naked but have clothing. People that have everything and yet are desperately poor. Who's the poor? people without the Lord. And the beauty of our message and, and the beauty of, of what the revelation is is of what the Christ is going to do, this is not an exclusive message. This is completely inclusive. I mean, we, we, we so much take this for granted. The covenant that the Lord made with Abraham is not just i got this chosen people in this, in this group that I'm going to witness to and all the rest of these, all these reprobates, all these ones far from me, all these ones that worship foreign gods, it says, we're going to take care of them. We would, we would rally to that message because it's us. We're the chosen, right? It says, all nations will be blessed through you. It's a universal message. And by the way, I'm convinced what's in the Bible is in there for a reason. I think what's not in there is there for a reason as well. And it sort of drives me crazy when people read all sorts of things in Scripture that are not there. The most important person in all of human history, the person that time itself is measured by, the one person who had no army, was not elected to office, was basically born poor, when he was offered, when he was offered as a dedication at the temple of his parents, they gave the offering of a poor rather than a lamb, a spotless lamb, they offered a couple of turtle doves. They didn't have any. That person, that person who came to save all of us is that the most important person in history. You know what it says about what he looks like in Scripture? You know how it describes his physical? It doesn't. Now, how is it with all these testimonies about Jesus, the Gospels, all these eyewitnesses, brother, all these letters, would you not think of describing something about what he looks like? Other than Isaiah says he wasn't much to look. And you know I feel it's not in there? Because if it wasn't there, we'd make too much of it. Oh, he's got brown eyes. I got brown eyes. You got brown eyes? He was bald. I'm bald. No, wait a minute. <laughs> Never mind. I don't think he was, by the way. But, but I think the reason it's not in there, we would make too much of it. You know why? Because we are nuts. Because we are poor. And, and the Lord wants to pour out to us what is everlasting and matters. And so to the church at Laodicea, he says, man, I'm in need of nothing. It's all good here. And he says, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, naked. You need salve for your eyes because you're blind. And there are none so blind as those who will not see. And so the Lord doesn't, doesn't go into great detail. It's on a need to no basis. And that's so that through this turmoil and struggles that we have is that there's faith. Because the truth is, when we look at all this Scripture and this testimony of the psalm that Rock read, and, and then in Isaiah, the, the passage in Isaiah, and, and it's so wonderful, when Jesus began His ministry in His hometown, and they knew who it was. He was, a, he was a simple man. He's Joseph's son. Carpenter. He's Mary's boy. And yet when he begins his ministry in his little hometown of Nazareth, and he goes in, and the tradition is the rabbi, the visiting rabbi would go in, and they would be handed a scroll, and they'd stand up, read the scroll, and then they would sit down, and they would, they would share a message, a sermon. And Jesus went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up on the Sabbath day. He went to the synagogue, as was his custom, and stood up to read. The scroll of Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, 
because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Thanks be to God. But here's the thing. John the Baptist pro- proclaimed as Christ was going to fix everything. The blind will see. The deaf will hear. The lame will... You know what? Jesus could have made everybody see that was blind. Right? He could have snapped his fingers. He's a creator. He's a living word. Everybody who was deaf, he could have fixed. Why didn't he? See, those miracles were testimony that he's the one. That's what they... They served a purpose. And we look and say, how come we don't see great miracles like that today? Well, I think we do. I think we do. We're just not quite as, as obvious or evident. But Jesus then said to pronounce the good news to the poor. His greater need. It's not doing one or the other, but understanding this message that is timeless and is for all. But we rather focus sometimes on those things that, that, that we think matter, but really don't. We're hard-headed people. How often do we have to see the same lessons over and over again before we realize, you know, when I do it my... And here's a pattern I've seen in my life. When I do things my way, and, and, and I'm, I'm pretty set in my ways. If you all know me, I'm, I'd be pretty hard-headed. You know, I'd probably argue with the best of them and yeah, quit nodding. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm, I'm, convinced, I'm convinced I'm right about everything. If I wasn't, I would change my mind. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. So regardless of what it is, I think... But, but here's the pattern I found is when I do things my way, you know what? Things don't tend to work out too well. For whatever reason. But when I submit and surrender what the Lord calls me to do, you know what? I'm never disappointed. So my human nature, my heart tells me one thing, that this is good, this, but that the Lord always says something because the world is always about right here and right now. Just take everything you can. Enjoy the moment. And, and it's, it's all about you know, that power and pleasure and money. And the Lord says, I've got a greater cause. Right now there's a lot of misery and suffering, but good things happen. Those who are patient and wait. And there's a reason why. I just saw another story this last week. Another one of those mega jackpot winners. Not the small winners. You know, not the people who only win three or four million because that's not, that's, that's not worth it. Isn't it funny? You know, the, 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 the jackpot will be like 50 million bucks. I'm not buying a ticket. It's $100 million. I'm not buying a ticket. Now it's 200. Hey, we better get a ticket. Who wants 100 million? We'll put it in for the two. So the mega jackpot winners, not the small ones, is that 70%, this Time Magazine, 70% of those are broke after four years. But worse, worse, how many of those, they call it the curse of the lottery. The curse of the, you know, the curse is winning the big lottery. Because the vast majority of the mega jackpot winners are sorry they won the lottery. Now you're thinking, let me try. <laughs> So I saw another story this, this past week about this, and so I, I just made a little printout. I will now share about riches and poverty. And so it's Jack Whitaker, who won $315 million in West Virginia. He was 55. He was a construction company president at the time. He was broke within four years. And he said, through the way, he lost his daughter and granddaughter to drug overdoses, which he blamed on the curse of the Powerball win. And he said, my granddaughter's dead because of the money. And you know, my wife said she wished I had torn the ticket up. Well, I wish I'd torn that ticket up too. Then he says about himself, I don't like Jack Whitaker. I don't like the heart I've got. I don't like what I've become. Won $315 million. A man named uh, Abraham Shakespeare was in Florida, won $30 million. Uh, He was murdered by a man who befriended him after he won the jackpot. And uh, his brother told the BBC that he said, my brother always told me I would have been better off broke. He told me that all the time. Then there's uh, Donna Mikan who won $34.5 million New York State Lottery. She said the big win ruined her life. It led to emotional bankruptcy. Most of us think that winning the lottery is the ultimate fulfillment. I find that wasn't the case. Most people look at winning the lottery as some magic pot of gold waiting for you at the end of the rainbow. So before she won, she considered herself a happy person. 
When we won the lottery, my inner dialogue was manic. I became more concerned about how I was being judged and perceived, not realizing I was the one doing the judging in the first place. If you ask me, my life was hijacked by the lottery. Y'all want to win? I know you do. But Jesus has something better. Preaching good news to the poor. What he means is, you know what the good news is? The gospel? Is that the Lord is sitting there with arms wide open and we don't have to worry about that judgment that we face in the world. We don't have to worry about performance. We don't have to worry about all those things. And every day we, we wonder ourselves, you know, am I worthy? Do you love me enough? A am, I, am I doing enough to earn your respect and your love? And I'm thinking, and what about all those things I want to cover up and hide? You know, those thoughts that if you, if you really knew me, if you, really, you, you wouldn't love me if you know those secrets. And the Lord says, I know it all. I know it all. And the good news is, it's okay just as you are. As a matter of fact, I love you while you were still an enemy of mine. Oh yeah, I love you so much that I've sent my one and only Son to die on that cross that whoever shall believe in Him, whoever, whoever it is, I would believe in Him, would not perish, but have eternal life. That's why I'm talking about it. Talk about it, Mary. It's for all those people that don't have a Christmas. They've never been in Christmas home. They don't have anything before we give them. That's why I want that call. You want to invite them. Amen. And a lot of people will feel, and, and what we really want is that it, there's greater need than the physical need. Isn't there? Would you rather be financially broke or morally broke? Would, would you rather be, uh, have a, a lack of finances or would you rather be poor in integrity or character? What would you rather have? I'd rather be poor and show love with what I got. Me too. Amen. Mary, do you want to preach? <laughs> I think Mary's trying to let me know we're getting late. <laughs> and we are. But you know, we don't, and, and it's not one or the other. We, we want to meet the physical needs. We want to go down and help those who are needy in the homes. But the idea is to, to share the greater need, which is the understanding that the Lord God Creator in heaven came so that the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, and that we would hear the good news. And the good news is God is alive and well. And even though the world is a mess, it's all temporary. And His promises, He will fix all of it. And those who come to Him will never be hungry, will never be thirsty, will never be lonely, and will never face the judgment for any sin any sin ever, as long as you lay them at the foot of the cross, that Jesus Christ takes all our inadequacies, all our inequities, all those things that fall short, puts them behind the back of God, never to be remembered again. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, the gift of this season, for the joy that we have in you, apart from circumstances. May we share from the abundance of what you've done for us that we would have an opportunity to share the good news with the poor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the Sermon on the Hymn Book, 245, the first Noel. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. <laughs>
5.30 breakfast. You now receive the benediction. Go forth from this place with hearts full of assurance to the Lord that came here to proclaim the good news is alive and well and sends us out to do the same. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Go peace.